which is the best UK active fund. Remember, the job of these funds is to beat the overall market. And you can buy the overall market very cheaply now for almost nothing through these cheap index trackers. Now, I can't guarantee that I'll find the UK equivalent of Warren Buffett, but I certainly think these three funds are contenders for that crown. The first is Fundsmith, the second is Linzel Train, and the third is Vanguard Value. So we'll look at the risks that they take, their strategy, and what we think they'll do in the future. So here we go. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. This is how Warren Buffett starts every investor newsletter with his performance versus the S&P 500 since 1965. That's a 52-year investment period. You can see his outperformance more clearly if we look at it as a graph. You can see that in some years he did underperform, but on the whole, the performance has been spectacular. What's also interesting is as the fund has grown, the degree by which he outperforms the S&P 500 has gradually fallen. So the bumper years aren't quite so large as they were in the past. And that's a problem facing these funds that we'll discuss. So let's look at the investment managers because that's the primary driver behind the returns of the fund. Starting with Fundsmith, it's all about Terry Smith. He's an incredible investor with a very long track record. Before he founded Fundsmith, he ran the Tullet Prabond Pension Fund for seven years. And remember, that period spanned the credit crisis. And over that period, he returned 14% per annum. And since he set up Fundsmith, as we'll see, he's also had very strong returns. And Terry frequently says that Julian Robbins is an integral part of the stock selection process. And it's clear that these two form a very effective team when selecting stocks which outperform the market. These are the three fund managers for Linzel Train. Linzel Train was set up the year after Fundsmith in 2011, and the expertise of the three fund managers complements each other very nicely. Nick Train's specialty is more in UK and global funds, whereas Michael Linzel has a great deal of expertise in Asian stocks, particularly Japanese stocks, which, as we'll see, is why there's a very large Japanese allocation in the Linzel Train Global Equity Fund. And it's also great to see that James Bullock has joined the team in 2015, and that's brought some young blood to the fund management team. Vanguard Value is the odd one out because it's a quant fund. Instead of having humans run the fund, there's a very simple set of rules which run the fund. These rules have been constructed by a team of analysts at Vanguard. And the purpose of the rules is to implement some research on value, which shows that cheap stocks outperform the broader market over the long term. So those were the teams, and here are their investment strategies. Fundsmith favours companies which have a high return on capital employed. That's a measure of how efficiently the company is using the capital that's been provided by shareholders and bondholders. But Fundsmith also looks for companies that can reinvest those earnings at a similarly high rate of return, because that means they can grow their earnings organically at a very high rate and push up their share price. Fundsmith are almost obsessed with disruptive technologies, and they look for stocks which can survive such disruption. One of the traps that you can fall into if you look for companies with high return on capital employed is companies which have too much debt. So one of the screens that Fundsmith applies is to take away companies which have too much leverage. And Terry Smith sums up their strategy with the acronym ODD. They only invest in good companies. They don't overpay for those companies where they compare the price to their fundamental valuation models and they do nothing. In other words, they try to have as few transactions as possible because that increases brokerage fees. Linzel Train's focus is on brands or franchises that have been around for a long time. Remy Quantro is one of the examples they often cite, and they say they look for companies which have been around for decades or even centuries, but they also want companies which have a sustainable future. In other words, the brands and franchises are still relevant. They like companies which have strong intellectual property portfolios. For example, one of their biggest holdings is in Nintendo, and like Fundsmith, they don't like to have too much in terms of transaction costs, because they see those as a tax on their client's capital. As we saw, Vanguard value is rule-based, so it starts with shares from the FTSE developed all-cap index combined with the Russell 3000, but the purpose of the fund is to buy shares which are cheap. It ranks all of its potential stocks according to three measures of value. Then it invests in the top third, and it continually rebalances this portfolio 
So if a company becomes too expensive, it drops out of the portfolio. And if one of the companies becomes cheap, it comes into the portfolio. And the measures it uses are price to earnings ratio, estimated future earnings and operating cash flow. How well have the funds actually performed? Here I'm comparing Fundsmith on the left with Linzel Train on the right. And I've broken down the returns year by year. The fund returns are in blue and I've compared them both with the iShares MSCI World ETF, which is shown in red. So in 2011, Fundsmith outperformed by 8% and Lintel Train by 6 In 2012, 2% and 1%. Then in 2013, the MSCI shot up by 25%. And the outperformance for both wasn't great that year. Fundsmith underperformed by 1% and Lintel Train outperformed by just 3%. Then Fundsmith had a great year in 2014, outperforming by 9%. Lintel Train underperformed by 4%. Both funds had a great 2015, 11% and 15% outperformance. And again, we see this pattern in 2016, where the MSCI shot up by 30%, and both funds underperformed. But in 2017, both had a bumper year. They beat the MSCI World ETF by 9%, and Linzel Train managed 13%. The cumulative return for the two funds is now comparable. Fundsmith is just a little bit more than Linzel Train. The Vanguard Value Fund has only been around since the end of 2015. So here I've shown the cumulative return over time in black for Vanguard Value, Fundsmith is green, and Linzel Train is blue. And you can see the three track each other surprisingly closely, such that the overall return is about 71-73% to 73 for Linzel Train and Fundsmith, but just 62% for Vanguard Value. And I've adjusted Vanguard's return for the fees, which aren't included in its return, whereas they are for Linzel Train and Fundsmith. The thing to remember is that value as a factor has been shown to outperform for a very, very long time, even though the Vanguard Value Fund hasn't been around for long. For example, in a 2017 paper by Dimson, Marsh and Staunton, they tracked the UK market since 1955, that's a 61-year period, and the overall UK market returned 12.1% per year, whereas value outperformed by 3.9% over that period, returning 16% in total. 3.9% might not sound like much, but when you compound that over 61 years, the outperformance is huge. For the US, they had 90 years of data, and while the market returned 9.8%, value outperformed by 3.1% per year. Again, that compounds into a very strong outperformance over the long term. So if we look back in history, value works very effectively as a strategy, which suggests that Vanguard value will also outperform over the long term. So now let's consider what risks these funds are taking in order to outperform the market, because there's no additional return without taking an additional risk. The obvious risk for Fundsmith and Linzel Train is concentration. Both Fundsmith and Linzel Train have a very small number of stocks in their portfolio. And what we're comparing here is the top 10 funds as a proportion of the total portfolio. And you can see that for Fundsmith and Linzel Train, that top 10 makes up about a half of the portfolio. So if even a handful of the stocks were hit by some crisis, it would make a very big dent in the portfolio. Now there are always unknown unknowns. It could be a trade war, an epidemic, a disruptive technology, or simply some kind of crisis that we could never foresee. Compare that with Vanguard Value on the right, and the top 10 stocks only make up 4% of the portfolio, because Vanguard Value contains over a 1,000 stocks. So you should certainly be aware of this concentration risk for Fundsmith and Linzel Train, both in single stocks and also in sectors. And that's a risk which you don't have for Vanguard Value. Manager risk is also something you have to consider. What if one of these fund managers was to retire, either voluntarily or involuntarily, due to illness? One of the problems with finding good fund managers is you have to wait several years to know that they're good. And by this time, they haven't got many years left in them. Nick Train and Michael Lindsell are both pushing 60, and Terry Smith is into his mid-60s. I couldn't find the age of Julian Robbins, but at a guess, I'd say he's 40-ish. So say, for example, Terry Smith were to retire and Julian Robbins took over. While Robbins is a very capable stock selector, he certainly doesn't have the same charisma as Terry Smith. So if this succession were to happen, the question on investors' minds would be, can Julian Robbins still draw in the capital 
while carrying on the fund as he ran it with Terry Smith? Or would some magic ingredient have been lost? And if James Bullock takes over from Nick Train and Michael Linzel, surely he'd want to set up the James Bullock Fund, which he'd run in his own way, rather than running a fund with the name of two people who've retired. The beauty of Vanguard Value is that it doesn't have fund managers, so there's no worry about succession risk. It simply mechanically implements a set of rules, which research has shown work over the long term. There's no cult of personality with Vanguard Value. If you remember the graph we saw of Warren Buffett's returns diminishing over time as the fund grew larger, it's interesting to compare the size of the three funds. Fundsmith is growing very rapidly. It already contains almost £16 billion in July 2018. And that's a problem because it can't buy small stocks, which are the ones which tend to outperform most strongly over time. So it becomes more difficult to outperform by such a large degree as the fund gets bigger. Lindsay Train doesn't have this problem yet. It's only 5 billion in size. And Vanguard Global Value Factor is a minnow in comparison. It's only about 160 million in size, less than a billion. But because it has over a thousand stocks in the portfolio, it could grow much larger than the other two without having to worry about buying very large stakes in particular stocks. That's one of the benefits of being diversified. So the question now is can Fundsmith continue to outperform? given its very large and still growing size. One of the problems of any global fund is the disproportionately large size of the US equity market. The benchmark for these funds is the MSCI World Index. And in the bottom right, you can see that the US makes up 61% of the country weights. Japan trails far behind at about 9%, and the UK is only 6%. Apple alone is about 2% of that global index. And the iShares MSCI World ETF, which simply tracks that index, has exactly the same country allocations. You can see that the US is over 60%. As a diversified global fund, Vanguard is the closest to MSCI World's country weightings, with an extremely large US weighting. Whereas Linzel Train has a much larger UK weighting, and thanks to Michael Linzel's expertise, a very large Japanese weighting of about 22%. Now, Japan is often seen as a safe haven when there's a stock market crisis. So many people see Linzel Train as a defensive portfolio because of this Japanese allocation. And for UK investors, the 27% UK allocation means that you're taking less foreign exchange risk because those UK stocks will be denominated in sterling. Fundsmith has the 60% allocation to the US and a UK weighting of about 18%. So it'll be very sensitive to the sterling dollar exchange rate and also sensitive to any fluctuation in the US market. So bear in mind that some of the returns for these funds will come from the sterling exchange rate versus the US dollar versus the euro and all the other major currencies in which it's invested. So when you buy the fund, you're also buying the currency risk that comes with it. A fairly conventional measure of risk is to look at the volatility. That's a typical daily percentage price move of the stock. And here you can see that they're fairly similar. The MSCI World ETF is around 13%. Vanguard Value is a little bit higher in terms of volatility. And Lintel Train and Fundsmith are a little bit less. But there's not much to discriminate between the funds in terms of volatility. If we look at the correlation of the funds, that's a little bit more interesting because two of the correlations stand out as being fairly high. Vanguard Value and the iShares MSCI World, with ticker SWDA, have a very high correlation of over 90%. So it probably wouldn't make any sense to have both of these in a portfolio, because they're highly correlated. You'd either have Vanguard Value or iShares MSCI World. Similarly, Fundsmith and Linzel Train's global equity funds have a correlation of about 80%, which is very high. So again, it wouldn't make sense to have both of them in a portfolio. You'd either have Fundsmith or you'd have Lindell Train. So what's the risk of Vanguard value? I'd call it something like popularity risk. This is a warning graph from Vanguard, which shows that each of the factors can underperform for very long periods of time. So if you're going to invest in these kind of factors, you have to stick with it over the very long term. And that can be an extremely punishing discipline. You have to overcome many cognitive biases in order to stick to your guns. Of course, we have to think about the fees that we're paying for each of these funds. Now, what I hate about Linzel Train and Fundsmith Equity is that they have these share classes. 
These are the ongoing charges which I've shown in red, and they vary across platforms. And it looks like Hargreaves Lansdowne offers a bargain, because they've negotiated a 0.2% saving. But Hargreaves is one of the more expensive platforms. So if you include the platform fee, which is the charge for just holding your investments, it turns out that the total is actually cheapest on the cheaper platforms. And that more than compensates for the savings you would have got from Hargreaves Lansdowne. So AJ Bell looks like the cheapest platform in terms of ongoing charges at 0.91%. I found that the I-Class was available on all of these platforms for Fundsmith Global Equity. And Fundsmith was more expensive than Lindell Train on average. And when you combine that with the platform fee, the cheapest overall cost was on AJ Bell and Smart Investor at 1.15% per year. Now Vanguard Value is just an exchange traded fund. And that means it charges the same fee on every platform. And I love that simplicity and transparency. And it means you're not locked onto any one platform because of some discount. Although it's worth saying that Fidelity didn't have Vanguard value. Now the ongoing charge for Vanguard value is extremely low, just 0.22%. And the cheapest platform on which you can hold it is Vanguard's own Vanguard Direct platform, which charges just 0.15% per year. And that means the cheapest place to hold Vanguard value of these platforms is Vanguard Direct. And that's a very competitive combined cost of 0.37% per year. Now Vanguard value is about 0.6% cheaper than the other two. And though that doesn't sound like much, over decades that can compound to a very large saving. We don't know what markets are going to do. We don't know how well the fund managers are going to do. But what we do know is that Vanguard value will always be cheaper than the other two. And finally we can ask what will happen in the future. My concern is with the reliability of fund managers. History is littered with fund managers who outperform for very long periods of time, but sometimes, inexplicably, they lose this ability to outperform. Even if they're given carte blanche with a completely new fund, they somehow can't reproduce the successes of the past. Bill Miller was once fated as a complete genius, because remarkably, he managed to outperform the S&P for 15 consecutive years. But then the credit crisis came along, and wiped out all of the gains which he'd had over the previous 15 years. So Miller's strategy stayed the same, but it failed to work in this new market environment of the credit crisis and its aftermath. Sometimes a fund manager is very successful in one market, but then fails to replicate that success in another market. And Anthony Bolton is a standard example of this failure to transfer skills from one market to another. And in very rare cases, the very strong incentive to outperform produces fraud. So I don't really buy into this culture of star managers, because managers are simply too unreliable. It's my belief that the future will be like the past. Perhaps it won't be identical, but it certainly acts as a guide. Now there are lots of opinions out there about what's going to happen to markets in the future. So what we really need is a bullshit filter. And that filter is peer-reviewed research because it's the best way I know of getting a handle on the truth. We've known since the late 1990s that certain types of stock outperform the market, based on seminal research by Farmer and French. And over time, research has expanded that range of factors and confirmed the findings of Farmer and French for different markets across the world. So if I want to beat the markets, I put my faith in peer-reviewed research. Vanguard have industrialised the process of tracking these factors and made them available for just 22 basis points. So I put my faith in that research and paying very low fees to get access to those factors. But ultimately, it's all a matter of faith. Do you put your faith into human fund managers who tell a great story, or into peer-reviewed research which shows what things have worked in the past, with the assumption that those will work in the future? I hope you found that video useful. If you did, then consider supporting us on Patreon because for just $5 a month, you can ensure that we carry on creating this content, which many of you tell me you do find useful. So let me thank the Patreon sponsors, which we currently have. Hugh Valentine, Alex Kemp, Gintautus Gerulitis, Louis Mayer, Corn Dutois, and Robert Guerrara. So just click on the buttons above to support us on Patreon or to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Thank you for listening.